Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to the analysis.news. Please don't forget there's a donate button at the top of the website. Amazon is so far the most significant corporation to emerge from the digital revolution. A beautifully and rationally organized, massive global corporation that employs 1.3 million people. Rationally organized internally, but part of the overall chaos that's today's hypercapitalism. When Amazon comes to a community promising jobs and a better life, does it deliver? Why are Amazon workers getting organized into unions even though Amazon claims they're getting all the benefits without the dues? Today I talked to two organizers from Detroit who have been waging a campaign to force the city to extract real promises of community benefits or turn the Amazon warehouse deal down. The city council and mayor didn't listen and are going ahead with the project anyway. Now joining us, Detroit attorney Tanya Myers Phillips, who currently serves as the Community Partnerships and Development Director of the Sugar Law Center for Economic and Social Justice, and Frank Hammer, a former president and bargaining chair of UAW Local 909 and General Motors at Warren, Michigan. He's co-founder of the Auto Workers Caravan and co-chair of the International Auto Workers Council GM section. Thank you both for joining me. So, Thank Tanya, you. start us off. Uh, give us a bit of the story. How, how did this all come about because it was it wasn't just about Amazon coming to Detroit it was about a, a fairgrounds that you thought the community should have some say in what happened to it so give us a bit of the background and, and and then we'll get into the whole fight with Amazon sure and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this very important discussion Paul I mean certainly what's happening in Detroit is not an anomaly it's happening in cities all across the United States and all across the world so we're pleased to share our fight and our struggle just as we continue to learn from from those of others in other cities as well so where to start um, of course Detroit you know um, Frank and I are both hardcore Detroiters. <laughs> I was born and raised in this city and still live here um, by choice, and I'm proud of my city. Um, we have a pretty hardcore reputation. Um, you know, we, we're a little scrappy in Detroit, right? We've been through um, uprisings. We've been through economic downturn. Um, we've, had, we've experienced hard times in the city of Detroit. And I say that as a backdrop to, it's important to recognize the context. We're not out of the woods yet. Um, Detroit is a predominantly African-American city. Um, about a third of the city right now um, are living in poverty. Um, when you look at structural poverty, um, you know, some statisticians look at it might be closer to 50%. And it's important to, to understand what our needs are. As, as residents in the city of Detroit. Um, the Michigan State Fairgrounds was, you know, prior to its closing, was um, one of the longest running public um, fairgrounds in the, a country, in the country. Um, just a beautiful uh, park, recreational activity. People have fond memories of free concerts, the Jackson Five, and many greats played there. I mean, the State Fair was an incredibly popular um, affair in Detroit. Unfortunately, um, a lobbyist um, petitioned and, and convinced um, our governor at the time to close it, and it, it was shuttered. Uh, so it, it's a 142-acre site, and, you know, there were various proposals presented for redevelopment of that site over the years, you know, that were not uh, ultimately approved by the city of Detroit. And this particular proposal came to light um, in August, August of last year, um, apparently it had been negotiated in secret for about a year, working out the details and the kinks. And um, our coalition, the State Fairgrounds Development Coalition, which Frank and I and many members of the community, over 200 members of the community, were, have worked together on to um, present holistic plans for the redevelopment of the site. So it wasn't a site where 
that nobody cared about pretty much. <laughs> and I want listeners to understand that, you know, we've done a lot of work, um, award-winning work on uh, proposal soliciting or setting the context to solicit proposals that included affordable housing, sustainable development, good jobs, recreation. I mean, just a nice 21st century modern, inclusive plan. We were informed in August that our uh, mayoral administration, our mayor and his team, agreed to sell the land to um, a private out-of-state developer so they in turn could lease the majority of the land to Amazon to build a warehouse. So we were told this was going to happen. That's what the deal was. And that was just it. You know, of course. We... So why aren't you jumping up and down for joy? Because <laughs> Amazon's coming, all these jobs and all of that. Well, you know, Amazon is one of the richest corporations in the world, right? And you'd think that prosperity will follow. But statistics demonstrate um, quite the opposite. Many Amazon workers continue to live in poverty, $15 an hour. The starting wage is better than the minimum wage, but it certainly is not a living wage. The retention rate with the Amazon Corporation, we were extremely and remain extremely concerned about that. We know the selling point that Amazon and the city puts forward as, you know, there are 1,200 jobs that will be created for Detroiters. But we know, and it's been well documented, that most Amazon workers um, do not last longer than a year. The company has a very poor retention rate. So these are not jobs that will last. These are not jobs that will propel families into a sustainable middle class. And, you know, Frank's going to talk a little bit more later about the necessity to um, organize and for unions to be able to uh, form and change those working conditions. But for right now, the Amazon effect has actually been shown to cause a net job loss, not only because workers are not retained, but because of Amazon's business model, because they are, and Congress is investigating this now, many people believe that they are a monopoly. The Amazon effect actually puts other small businesses in the surrounding area out of business. <laughs> so looking at this total Amazon effect that we've seen in other cities, we just are not convinced that this um, corporation will bring prosperity to Detroit, but will in effect, if no other actions take place, will continue to drive poverty in Detroit. And sometimes people okay, think we, of we, poverty. We, let, let's, let's just di let's, let's dig into this issue of retention rate to start with. Uh, what is it? What's the re normal retention rate, and why do you think it's it's so low? The retention rate. I, I think you were. I, I saw one stat. It's like over a ninety percent turnover within a year or something. Yes, yes, nearly a hundred percent. Why? That's part of the Amazon business model. You know, they are a private enterprise. They don't have to conduct their business in that way. But it, it seems to be more profitable for the Amazon Corporation to run a kind of churn and burn operation instead of investing in people's continual growth. As people um, remain employees, they expect, I don't know, an increase of promotion, you know, and it, right now it just doesn't appear to be in the Amazon business model to provide middle class jobs, but really, you know, a, te a teaser for a time to get you started and then drop you. And of course, we looked at the recent um, investigation to the, their tip workers, their, their flexing drivers or whatever they call them, and how um, the United States government recently found them, they settled that they were effectively stealing the wages, almost a third of those drivers pay and the, their business model, the way that they've essentially structured their business is one based on low wages and short wages. And how were they taking their wages? Well, they These are have, delivery drivers. Yes, they're delivery drivers and their delivery drivers are essentially they're contract workers. Most of them, you know, they work on a system and platform very close, very similar to that of Uber, Lyft, um, you know, your 
uh, ship workers and the particular algorithm they were using to calculate their wages and tips, they did not pay out all the money they were owed, essentially. And you this know, is the same, like Uber, as you say, there's been a lot of exactly, this going on with exactly. Uber. Exactly. But this. Amazon is one of the so, largest, so, yes. So you, so you had like almost 200 people involved in for a long time, yes. uh, you know, lobbying, planning, advocating what should happen with these fairgrounds. Um, and then they, this deal's made. Is there any consultation with your committee before the, the property is sold? No. No, um, we were um, provided a 24-hour, I would say it's a, a heads up or a FYI, but there was no um, community uh, call for input, no community planning. There wasn't even information until the deal was done. So the process was um, backwards. It was um, anti-democratic. The decision was made. And the reason why this matters is because this involved the sale of public land. This was 142 acres of public land. And the scale of this project, this would be the largest facility of its type in the nation upon completion. So the environmental and health impacts upon this poor Detroit community are going to be severe if no further action is taken. So this is... Well, how do they, I don't understand. How can they do that without public hearings? Well, we had public hearings after the fact, you know, um, and the hearings were, you know, pretty much designed to allow you, you had one minute of public comment, you could have your say, and then the vote was taken. But the negotiation of the deal was already done. <laughs> the purchase agreement had already been negotiated. In terms of, there were two things that needed to happen. We had to amend our city master plan. Normally, amending a master plan is a big deal. It takes time. You just don't change it willy-nilly. But in the city of Detroit, we had two hearings, a total of two hearings to amend the master plan that govern, governs the decision-making process and development for the next 10 years. We did this in two meetings. And one meeting stretched until after midnight after midnight and one of the commissioners vice chair lauren hood finally said this is inappropriate i don't feel after midnight i don't feel like i have enough information we've been in this meeting for seven hours it is almost bullying maybe that's not her word that might be my word okay <laughs> but it feels tantamount to bullying to ask someone to make a decision that can impact people for the next decade or more under those type of circumstances. So a master plan, of our master plan was amended from regional park to light industrial. In two meetings, that was it. And, um, <laughs> right, in a master planning process in other cities, you'd expect it to take months, maybe even a year, so now you did, can did do you, the proper studies. Uh, well, let me ask Frank, Frank, did you then present at some point the experience of Amazon in other cities and what the the sort of uh, data that Tanya is presenting does not make for a very persuasive argument for just handing this all over to Amazon. So I can tell you that if they had had their way, and I'm talking about the administration of Mayor Duggan here in the city, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about a city of over 80% African-American city council is majority African-American. But I can tell you that it was very clear from the outset that the city was uh, tone deaf to the community and was doing the Amazon's bidding. And they wanted to muscle it through all of it, including what Tanya just described, within a month. It was extraordinary. But they must have thought this was a big coup to get Amazon because of all these jobs. But did they not see some of the data that that Tanya's talking about? So I can tell you that whether they did or they didn't, they did not acknowledge it when we raised these issues. On the contrary, they, uh, with a straight face, on numerous occasions said, these are the jobs of the future, these are middle-class jobs, and they justified reality in order to promote Amazon's line, which is what they did, onto the city and and into the city council 
and uh, the the health issues that uh, we were raising, uh, because we're not only talking about uh, what, what Tanya was referring to earlier about the turnover, it's because of the rate of work. It's because of the speed of the process of in the warehouses that workers do not last. They suffer injuries. They suffer, uh, you know, breakdowns, nervous breakdowns, and so on, uh, because it is so uh, key to the robotics of the warehouses, which they are very proud of. Uh, the, uh, along with that, uh, we found out through one of their uh, studies, a traffic study, that at peak hours, they anticipated over 500 18 wheelers driving in and out of the site. And there are no provisions, no protections for the community, for the city of Detroit and beyond in regards to the emissions of these diesel trucks. And I think that by and large, uh, they did it so quickly that it's gonna take a while for the city to figure out, and I'm talking about the residents, that this is going to be a huge health hazard. I mean, we've been talking about COVID-19 for over a year now, uh, or close to a year, and we talk about all the preconditions, uh, asthma, heart conditions, and so on, and this Amazon warehouse is going to accelerate that, is going to uh, worsen what's already a sacrifice zone in, this, in the city of Detroit. So, and Paul, you're absolutely right. They, uh, they, you know, they put the, a bow on this and they said, oh, we're going we're gonna to create 1,200 jobs. Originally, they said it was going to be for Detroiters. We looked mm -hmm. at the purchase agreement. That was a lie. Mm -hmm. It was not promised to Detroiters. There was not a single job that's guaranteed for Detroit. Well, is it, what is guaranteed? What, is there any community benefit that's they are saying that they are making a contribution to construct a new transit center, and that is our community uh, benefit. But let me tell you what. What the does that mean? A bus that stop? Is. That means a, a glorified bus stop. Yes. Um, <laughs> right now, <laughs> right now, I mean, this is a prime area in the city of Detroit. It connects. Um, Detroit and Wayne County to Oakland County. It lays the state fairground is bordered on the iconic eight mile road. It's close to Interstate 75 Highway. It's close to Davison Highway and also it's close to um, the iconic Woodward Avenue. So this is a major, major intersection. I understand. Well, how much did they pay for the land? Um, they paid less than nine million dollars for the land. They paid less than $9 what, million dollars for the land. Now, what they're saying is, well, we made this contribution for this bus this bus depot also. So the city is, <laughs> our contention with them in the subject of our litigation is they're saying, no, 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 we paid $16 million for the land. They're like, no, you didn't. You paid um, about $9 million for the land, and you made a contribution towards the construction of this bus terminal, which is essential for Amazon's logistics to the fact that the city of Detroit even assumed liability in the purchase agreement for transportation. In the purchase agreement, it says if the city doesn't get this bus station built on time, the city is liable for providing Amazon's interim transportation capacity. That's how important it is. That's what that benefit is about. It's not about us. And they knock down, they put the station in the path of these historical assets where they're knocking down businesses, not businesses, but structures that are on the historical re registration list. So they're knocking down historical buildings. They've cut down all the old growth trees um, in order to get this um, new bus depot situated within a convenient five minutes for workers. And that actually amplifies the harm that Frank was speaking about earlier because you not only have this heavy diesel emission, in that location you will have over 30,000 bus riders coming into that location every week. So you have diesel emission, bus emission, car emission. It is going to be an environmental and health nightmare that we have little to no protections um, to guard against right now. Well, we're going to show a, we'll show a photograph of some kind, but how close to this site do people live? Right across, across the street. The street. 
said. Oh, it's right in a residential area. It is. Uh, it is. To the south, to the south and the east, there is a generally very blighted uh, residents uh, who have stuck it out. Uh, yeah, and they live right, you know, right, right across the uh, two lane street. Yeah. And uh, what and was the, the salon? Did you? Did you yeah. All right. yeah. And a home. Did you get an independent appraisal there. of the land? What, what, Frank? What, what would the land be worth if it was uh, market value? So, well, okay. time. You want to take that? Sure. Sure. Well, you know, we don't have the resources at this time to do a full-blown independent um, appraisal of our own, but we did do um, an assessment of their appraisal. And we do have some comparables that indicate, um, just looking at comparable land sales, that there could be an extra, at least an extra $2 million value on that land, just looking at comparables alone. Um and if you look at other independent appraisal methods, again, which we don't have the resources to um, fully explore at this time, um, then I do believe the value of that would come come back much higher. But where it, um, again, comes to our litigation, our community benefits um, statute tax, it's triggered to the land sale. You know, and when you look at land, our statute calls for when land is sold below fair market value, then the community benefits ordinance comes into play. And looking at their own appraisal, the appraisal that their um, party conducted, the land was appraised at roughly twelve million dollars, but they we wheedled it down to roughly nine million dollars. And based on their own um, documents and their own assessments, we believe our ordinance should be triggered and community members should be assembled and have a voice in the monitoring and um, regulation and oversight of this development going forward. So that's what we're fighting for right now. We don't think the vote should have happened. We think it, we deserve better as Detroiters. Um, we deserve so much better. But notwithstanding, even though the vote happened, we believe our ordinance demands that community members be assembled into an advisory commission where we can request documents, where we can hold their feet to the fire, and we can, you know, demand some other conditions that actually protect the health and quality of our life be set forward for this operation. So that's where we are now. And so this litigation is, is now in court, is it? You've, yes. It's been filed. Yes. And what are, what are the community benefits you're looking for? Well, we don't have enough health and safety protections. That's where we need to start, number one. In our um, expressions of discontent to the Detroit City Council, we did secure a provision for a health, a air quality survey to be implemented. And that is um, better than nothing, but it's not a lot better because it doesn't have any any regulations on, on those emissions levels and it doesn't do anything to address the fact that people are going to be harmed. And unfortunately, Detroit is not a stranger to air pollution as part of the um, a recent deal between the state of Michigan and Canada. We're building a um, a new bridge, and along with a new bridge comes additional truck traffic and environmental concerns. And part of the community benefits provision for that international deal, um, the city of Detroit was actually required to do a health impact study to study the, the various health harms and actually make a plan to address them. So residents that live in that particular area of town, because of this international agreement, um, they're getting things like air filters for their home, they're getting their windows retrofitted to make sure, you know, environmental pollution doesn't seep in. They're getting things that will actually protect them. They have community-based air monitoring stations so you can tell when the um, pollution levels are rising. Those are the type of things that we need ASAP near the state fairground site in order for people to have a fighting chance. So the city of Detroit has been through this before. They know how to do it. The main pushback to it is that it's expensive. Well, and we say human life is worth it. 
So that's where we are. That's one. Well, it, that's one hard, benefit. But it's hard to any. it's hard to believe that Amazon could afford any of this. Oh no, not such not a, the tr- tr- such a struggle struggling corporation. No, uh, Frank, not the uh, trillionaire Jeff uh, Bezos. No, no. <laughs> He, he could pay for it himself out of his lunch money. Um, right. Frank, uh, in the final analysis, the kind of community benefits you're talking about, so far at least, uh, are really for the community surrounding the warehouse. Uh, for the workers themselves that are going to be wind up working at this warehouse, it's really going to come down to whether they get organized or not. And there, there's a big organizing effort now going on in Alabama uh, that will make help set the tone for Amazon warehouses and, and offices right across the country. So wh- where is that out? And, and, and to what extent do you think Detroit workers will be looking at what's going on in Alabama? Yes. And uh, if I may, before I answer your question, uh, let me just add another note. We, one of the, one of the uh, stipulations that we were advocating for is the question of the sustainable development in regards to the issue of the climate crisis. Uh, the site is not only going to be occupied by Amazon, it's going to be occupied by two other industrial facilities that have not been named. And Amazon has been crowing about how climate conscious they are, but we haven't seen it in terms of what the plans are for the site. And uh, so we are concerned not only for the immediate health and uh, for Detroiters, but really, we have to be concerned about the uh, the planet, and that ultimately, of course, has an effect on Detroiters as well. And we're trying to hold uh, the developers, these two developers, one is being Perot from Dallas, we're trying to hold their feet to the fire that this is going to be a, a, a carbon neutral uh, site going forward. To go to your question. Well, doesn't, doesn't Bezos claim that he's all for such policy? Yeah, and we're all, you know, we want to cheer them on and say, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. But you know what? There's a whole bunch of other acreage on this site that's going to be industrially developed. What about those? Are they going to be also addressing the uh, zero emissions or is it just a, a veneer, a marketing ploy by Amazon because they know that the tide is turning and that people all over the world are now becoming increasingly concerned about the issue of the climate crisis. So I think it. It's a question, is it a marketing ploy, or are they going to insist that the entire site of the fairgrounds is going to be a sustainable site? Um, well, has your community had any direct contact with Amazon? Have you tried meeting with them? No, the city so, has done a fine job of blocking that kind of interaction. <laughs> but hopefully... How can um, they stop as, you? As time, as time goes on. Well, in this, this process, you know, they are the ones who... Um, have assembled the developer, brought the developer to the table. The city planning commission actually asked, you know, a representative from Amazon to come forward and to address the body and provide some assurance that Detroiters would get a fair shot at these these jobs, even though they are are not the kind of jobs that will lift anyone out of poverty, but they requested to come and they did not. And they understand that they have see in this type of thing, the city can use its leverage. It could have used its leverage in position to get them to the table to say, we're not going to do this deal until you come and give an account to people, the community of your intentions. Um, But they didn't. And Amazon is, protecting Amazon's interests. So they, they took full advantage of that that cover and did not, um, you know, the city made it very difficult for community members to assert that kind of leverage when they basically said, we're doing we're doing this anyway, don't worry about them. You know, we'll, we'll take care of it. So, um, but they aren't here yet. Well, There's still many more days until they get here. So we are looking at other ways of how to get them to the table, even though they didn't come initially. Uh, well, at some point, the issue of unionizing this warehouse, assuming it opens in Detroit. So what goes on in Alabama is, is going to have a lot to say in terms of where that's at. So where are things that Al- going? Where's that at in Alabama? So uh, Alabama is uh, a lot of eyes are on Bessemer, Alabama, where they built a warehouse. It's so it's so incredibly similar to Detroit. It's uh, Bessemer, Alabama is majority uh, black city, uh, over 80%. The workforce is 70% uh, 
African American. Uh, it was opened earlier this year, and uh, very rapidly, uh, workers really got the flavor of what it meant to work at Amazon. And lo and behold, where would you see the first union organizing drive of this kind? But in Alabama, of all places. Yes. <laughs> and what really what it speaks to is the strong working class tradition in Birmingham and what used to be the steel and the coal industry. And I think it's very clear that the union culture that was built didn't go away. And these workers are organizing. It's the... Uh, it's a, it's a small union of about 60,000 members. It's uh, the department store workers. They're affiliated with the United Food and Commercial Workers. And they're, they're uh, been organizing. They've been getting uh, card, cards signed. And they went to the NLRB. Uh, they requested uh, a certification for the union. And they requested a mail-in uh, ballots uh, in light of the coronavirus. Amazon vehemently uh, contradicted and said, oh, no, you got to do these in person, you know, under, this, under these conditions. Uh, NLRB uh, stuck to its guns. It's, the mailing uh, of the ballots is already initiated by, uh, started on February 8th. It will end sometime in the end of March. And there's now a uh, national uh, effort uh, to build solidarity with the Amazon workers in Alabama. Uh, it's a very important uh, uh, crossroads between the Black Lives Matter movement and the burgeoning union organizing that's going to be going on uh, more and more because people are really fed up with the working conditions that they're faced with. So there's a real nexus between uh, the historic Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the working class movement in Bessemer. So... All we can do, uh, they're going to have support actions on February 20th uh, across the country. There's uh, numerous states that already uh, are showing up. Uh, you can go to, uh, I think it's called Black Workers, Southern Workers, Southern Workers Justice, I believe it's called. You can go to the website and you can see whether there's a local support activity in your area. But it'd be really important to do. Uh, I, uh, apparently, the Amazon anti-union campaign has been so, I guess, vigorous or vicious that even yeah. some European investors that own, uh, I think it was like 20 or $30 million of Amazon stock issued a statement telling Amazon to back off. Uh, but what, what are some of the uh, things Amazon, Amazon's doing to try to fight the union? Well, let me, let me just say, uh, to come back to Detroit, we, we, we understood the nature of Amazon. So when we went to the mayor... And we went to the city council. We said, uh, all we want you to do is get Amazon to sign a statement that they will respect the labor law and allow workers to organize without interference. And the city ran interference for Amazon and said, oh, no, no, we couldn't possibly do that. We'd right. be caught. You know, they, we'd be guilty of, uh, you know, violating <laughs> the law. I mean, we went to such great lengths to, to, to interfere for Amazon in a non-union environment here in, this is Union Town. This is the Union Town in Detroit. So uh, now what Amazon is doing is uh, what they typically do in every warehouse. They have monitors, uh, you know, digital monitors on the workers. Uh, if they're caught talking union, they face discharge. Uh, I'm sure that's as well going, going on there. They've opened up a website now. Uh, do it without dues, I think it's called. So they've gotten anti-union law firms that their specialty is to prevent unions from organizing the workplace. So they're going all, all out to try to prevent this example of unionization because they know that if these workers make a breakthrough that it'll be just a matter of time before other That's warehouses right. uh, begin to get organized as well. And when they open the one here in Detroit, we'll be ready mm -hmm. for them. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, Detroit is Union Town, but mm -hmm. Detroit is UAW Union Town. Mm -hmm. Has UAW, do you think, if they haven't already, would they get involved, support a unionizing effort? So we've reached out to uh, some of the unions uh, in the city of Detroit. I want to tell you that uh, the one that came has come forward and, in fact, joined us in a demonstration at the fairgrounds 
was a SEIU uh, local one. Uh, we had a, a political uh, director of that union with us, and uh, we will be reaching out to the Metro AFL CIO here. We'll be reaching out to the restaurant hotel workers. Uh, you know, we have a, a series of gambling casinos. We will be reaching out to my union, the UAW, and saying, "You got to get on board. We're gonna we're gonna unionize this place when they open it." Uh, Tanya, in terms of the people living in the communities neighboring the fairground site, um, how are ordinary people responding to all this? Is there activism there? Are people getting you know organized, or are they a little bit uh, betwixt and between because there might be some yeah. jobs there? Yeah, a little of both. A little of both. I will say that one element, which is really unfortunate. You know, a lot of too many people still don't fully even understand what happened, you know, um, just like so many other places, you know, we're um, working from home, people are sheltering in place, you know, we're not able to gather and the technology divide is a problem um, in, in terms of organizing and getting information out. Um, people traditionally go downtown to the city hall meeting. You go to your block club, you go to your churches, you know, that's how you get information, how you organize and find out what the word is. But getting on, on Zoom, you know, is uh, it's just, it's a challenge. You know, there's a very real technology divide and it cuts across race and class. Even if people don't want to talk about it, it's true. And a lot of people don't, have not got um, all of the information about this deal, um, unfortunately. Some people, you know, do believe that there will be um, a job around. Um, some people believe that Amazon will cause further development. That's how it was marketed, a very one-sided kind of marketing scheme by the city. And individuals should be able to believe they're public officials. That's what you should be able to do. Um, so you can't fault the people for that. And then there are many that stand with us and, you know, are furious about the sale of this property, that don't believe we received enough compensation, that believe um, black vendors are, you know, being shut out of the construction bidding process, not just for this development, but it's been a problem in Detroit for a long time, looking at um, African-American firms and firms of color um, receiving a contract to work on these development deals. And people are concerned about the environmental impact um, surrounding the community. You know, there are seniors living across the street. There are individuals living in single homes across the street. And going back towards Woodward, it is a slightly um, more prosperous area of Detroit, but it's dense. And as those trucks are coming down, going to come down neighborhoods, you know, a lot of people are not looking forward to how it will literally um, change the face of, of the community from what was, what is now mostly, you know, residential area, you know, becoming an industrial hub. It's going to change. Um, but we are certainly continuing Does to get information out about what's coming. Does, mm -hmm. Do you think it leads in the communities neighboring more industrialization or gentrification? It seems to be leaning more industrialization, really, and looking at looking at what they have in mind for the site and the I mean it, it's a large, large piece of land here. Um, and I, I think it's going to be difficult for communities to I don't think people who gentrify are going to want to live next to that facility. And some of the comments that we heard, you know, in our very, very limited um, public sessions were, how is this going to affect my property? You know, am I going to have to move? You know, is my, are, are my, is my property going to dive in value? Am I going to be stuck here next to a warehouse, you know, and not able to sell, you know, later on? And those concerns were uh, really uh, brushed aside. Um, and and not answered. And so looking at the trends in other cities, unfortunately, with this particular development, it looks like more industrialization. And those, um, particularly those who do not have the means um, to take care of their own property, you know, who don't have property to sell, who are just um, living and existing the best they know how, are really going to catch the brunt of this. And all of those transit workers who will be exposed to 
these harmful emissions day in and day out, you know, are, are going to catch it. Um, and unfortunately, that impact also cuts along race and class as well. Uh, just finally, Frank, how's the media been covering this in Detroit? And, and where's, is, the, is, the, is the public aware of what's going on? So, uh, and I, ha- I have to say that uh, due to the fact that our coalition has had a really excellent uh, media uh, person working with us, uh, we've actually managed to get our side of the story, by and large, into the corporate media, including uh, the, um, the, the two major uh, newspapers, Crane's Business, uh, it's been really rather extraordinary that we've been able to get our message out as well as we have. Um, but I can tell you, in, in the absence of our coalition, in the absence of the community voices, I mean, it was very clear that they were going to completely adopt the city's narrative and Amazon and the two developers, their narrative to, to give to Detroit. And that's what we've had to fight. We've had to combat this narrative of, oh, you know, we're getting jobs and this is going to be this is going to be the best thing since sliced bread and so on. And I think that we've been able to counter that with an effective uh, media strategy, uh, and especially in light of the things that Tanya was describing as what limits our immediate day to day contact with a lot of the people that are going to be affected. Uh, Tanya, where, where do people go on the Web if they want to find out more about all this? Well, you can catch us on Facebook. You can go to, um, we're on, on Facebook, so Michigan State Fairgrounds. Did I get the Facebook site right, Frank? I don't want to screw, screw it up. But our website is definitely mifairgroundsfuture.org. But catch us on Facebook or our website. And let's just double check and make sure that I, that I had the right, that I gave the right site there, and, Frank. Yes, and the site is okay. mi, my fairgroundsfuture.org and the, and the Facebook is the future of the Michigan State Fairgrounds. It's kind of a long name. All right. Well, we'll come back and revisit this when uh, things get further along. Uh, thank, thank you both for joining me. Thank you so much, Thank Paul. you so very much, Paul. And thank you for joining, joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget there's a donate button at the top of the webpage. page.